Welcome to this video on angular momentum, where I'll discuss the formulas of angular momentum, conservation of angular momentum, and solve four carefully chosen example problems. This is video 9 in my rotational motion playlist. Let's start with a quick reminder about the unit vectors. I hat, J hat, and K hat point along the X, Y, and Z axis in a standard 3D Cartesian coordinate system. To understand angular momentum, you need to know about the cross product. You've seen it before with torque, which is R cross F. Angular momentum is defined in a similar way, R cross P. In general, angular quantities are linear quantities multiplied by a distance from the axis. Physics uses a right-hand coordinate system to define direction consistently. The cross product of the unit vectors is summarized in this box. For example, I hat cross J hat equals K hat. Here's an example of computing that cross product with the right-hand rule. Point your fingers in the direction of the first vector, in this case I hat, curl them towards the second vector, in this case J hat, and your thumb points in the direction of the result, in this case K hat. The right hand rule keeps our vector directions consistent in 3D space. The cross product of two vectors, A cross B, equals the magnitude of vector A times the magnitude of vector B times the sine of theta, the angle between the two. Here's an applet from GeoGebra to help visualize the cross product. This is vector A and this is vector B. These are the same two vectors drawn in a 3D coordinate system and this red vector is the cross product A cross B. The cross product of two vectors, one and two, takes the magnitude of vector two and multiplies it by how much of vector one is perpendicular to it. It equals the area of the parallelogram formed by the two vectors and gives a vector that's perpendicular to both input vectors. If I rotate vector B like this, the area of the parallelogram gets larger. The cross product is a bigger vector. And if I rotate vector B like this, the area of the parallelogram gets smaller, eventually reaching zero area. Now I wanna discuss how to calculate the angular momentum of a single particle about a specified origin of rotation. In physics, the letter L represents angular momentum. L equals R cross P. R is the radius from the origin of rotation to the location of the particle, and P is the linear momentum. Angular momentum equals R P sine of theta, and that's equal to the radius times the component of momentum perpendicular to the radius. A question I had when I was first learning this material was how can a single particle moving in a straight line have angular momentum? It only matters if it hits something that can rotate. In that case, the angular momentum can transfer and cause rotation. Now I want to discuss how to calculate the angular momentum of an extended rotating object. Imagine this is a disk rotating about its center of mass. To calculate the angular momentum of the entire disk, we break it up into many small mass elements, calculate the angular momentum of each mass, and sum them all up. The angular momentum of a given mass element is its linear momentum, mv, multiplied by its radius. For a rotating object, the linear momentum and radius are always at a 90 degree angle, and sine of 90 is equal to one. For a rotating object, V is equal to R omega. The angular momentum of each mass element is MVR, which is equal to MR squared omega. If I sum up the angular momentum of every mass element, I get the angular momentum of the entire object, which is equal to the sum of MR squared times omega. Each mass element in the object has the same angular velocity omega. You may recall this sum is equal to the moment of inertia of the object. This leads to the important formula for the angular momentum of a rotating object. L equals I omega. I is the moment of inertia and omega is the angular velocity. Before moving on to solve the example problems, I want to discuss conservation of angular momentum. Angular momentum equals I times omega, and the time derivative of angular momentum is equal to I times alpha. But we know I alpha is equal to the net torque. What this tells us is if you have an isolated system where the net torque is zero, the angular momentum must always be the same. The angular momentum before a collision or redistribution of mass equals the angular momentum after a collision or redistribution of mass. If the mass of an isolated system undergoes a redistribution in some way, the system's moment of inertia changes. A change in I for an isolated system requires a change in omega. The angular velocity might change, but the angular momentum does not. Let's solve some problems to really get a strong understanding of this material. Question one. A five kilogram rod of length 0.6 meters lies at rest in a horizontal plane and can rotate freely about an axis through its center. A five gram bullet is fired at a 60 degree angle to the rod and strikes its end. The bullet sticks to the rod and the system starts to rotate at 10 radians per second. What was the speed of the bullet before the collision? To solve this problem, when we use conservation of angular momentum. There's no net torque on the system, so the initial angular momentum before the collision equals the final angular momentum after the collision. Initially, the rod is at rest at a zero angular momentum. The bullet has all the angular momentum, RMV sine of theta. That has to equal to the final angular momentum, which is the moment of inertia of the combined system times the final angular velocity. It's trivial to solve this equation for V, and this allows us to calculate the velocity of the bullet before the collision. 
I is the combined moment of inertia of the rod plus the bullet. The moment of inertia of a rod about its center of mass is 1 12th ml squared, and the moment of inertia of the bullet, a single mass, is mr squared. This allows us to calculate the combined moment of inertia. 0.15 kilograms meters squared. We know R, M, theta, and omega, therefore we can calculate the initial velocity of the bullet, 1,158 meters per second. This is an animation from GeoGebra to help better visualize this problem. This is a rod with a rotation axis through its center. Initially, the bullet has all the angular momentum. Once the bullet hits the rod, the bullet loses angular momentum, the rod gains angular momentum, and the total angular momentum of the system remains the same. I can remove the rotation axis, allowing for both rotation and translation. Do you know if the final angular velocity is larger with or without the rotation axis? Let us know in the comment section below. Question number two. A thin rod of length 1 meter and mass m is spinning clockwise at 10 radians per second around an axis through one end. A rock with mass m over 6 is traveling at a speed of 30 meters per second in the opposite direction of the rod's rotation. It collides with the rod at a 90 degree angle. The particle sticks to a rod at a location d from the rotation axis. Find the value of d so after the collision, the rod and particle are stationary. If d is larger than this value, which way will the rod rotate? To solve this problem, we use conservation of angular momentum. Angular momentum before the collision equals angular momentum after the collision. The final angular momentum is zero because after the collision, the system is at rest. Initially, the rock has a negative clockwise angular momentum, negative r times p, r is d and p is mv, and the rod has a positive angular momentum, i times omega. The moment of inertia of a rod is one third ml squared when it's rotated about one end. You can easily rearrange this equation and solve for d. When we plug in values, we find d equals 0.667. If this rock, at the momentum given, strikes this rod at a distance of 0.667 meters from the rotation axis, the system comes to rest. If the distance is larger than 0.667, the system rotates in the clockwise direction. Problem number three. A man of mass 70 kilograms stands at the center of a frictionless merry-go-round of mass 200 kilograms and radius 2.5 meters. The system spins with an initial angular speed of two radians per second. The man walks slowly outward to the edge. What happens to the angular speed when he moves outward? Find the final angular speed, omega f, when he reaches the edge. Find the change in rotational kinetic energy and explain why it changes. To solve this problem, we use conservation of angular momentum. The initial moment of inertia is the moment of inertia of the merry-go-round, plus the moment of inertia of the man when he's standing at the center. When the man is standing at the center, his radius from the origin is zero, so the initial moment of inertia is just the moment of inertia of the merry-go-round. The final moment of inertia is the moment of inertia of the merry-go-round, plus the moment of inertia of the man when he stands on the far edge. Conservation of angular momentum says angular momentum initial equals angular momentum final. Moment of inertia initial times omega initial equals moment of inertia final times omega final. We can rearrange this equation and solve for omega final equals omega initial times moment of inertia initial divided by moment of inertia final. The moment of inertia of a disk is one half mr squared. We're given all the information to calculate numerically the initial and final moment of inertia. Plugging in all the values, we find that the final angular velocity is 1.18 radians per second. Merry-go-round slowed down as the man walked to the outer edge. Kinetic energy of rotation is one half i omega squared. The initial kinetic energy was one half i initial omega initial squared, and that's 1,250 joules. The final kinetic energy is one half i omega squared, but now we have to use omega final and i final. So the final kinetic energy is 739 joules. That tells us that the kinetic energy of the system changes as the man walked from the center to the outer edge of the merry-go-round. As the man walked to the outer edge, he did work using stored potential energy in his body and decreased the total energy of the system. Here's an animation from GeoGebra to help you visualize the problem. There's a man standing at the center of a rotating merry-go-round. As he walks to the outside edge, he increases the moment of inertia of the system, but angular momentum must be conserved, so angular velocity has to decrease. As he walks towards the center, the rotation starts to increase again. He can walk to the outer edge and slow it down. As the person walks in and walks out, he's doing work on the system and changing the kinetic energy of the entire system. Here's the final problem number four. A solid cube of mass m and side length 2x rests on a horizontal surface and can rotate about the axis AB. A bullet of mass m much smaller than big M moves at a speed v and strikes the cube at a distance 4x over 3 from the bottom. The bullet embeds into the cube. Find the minimum speed v needed to tip the cube onto its face. Recall, the moment of inertia of a cube is two-thirds ml squared. In this case, the side length is 2x, so our cube has a moment of inertia equal to 
8 thirds mx squared. In order for the cube to tip over, after the bullet hits it, it has to have enough kinetic energy to rotate up to this location. Otherwise, the cube won't tip over onto its opposite face. I know the cube has side lengths of 2x. Using the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, I can calculate the length of this diagonal, 2 times root 2x. Ignoring the mass of the bullet, the center of mass of this box is a distance of x from the bottom. The center of mass of this box is a distance of root 2x from the bottom. So for the box to tip over, the center of mass must rise from x to root 2x. This corresponds to a change in potential energy, mg delta y. Immediately after the bullet strikes, the box has all kinetic energy. In order for it to rotate up like this, all of the kinetic energy must be lost and transformed into a change in potential energy. Kinetic energy 1 half i omega squared equals change in potential energy, and this allows us to solve for omega squared, the initial angular velocity of the block immediately after the bullet strikes. To solve for the initial velocity of the bullet, we use conservation of angular momentum. Initially, the bullet has all the angular momentum. The linear momentum of the bullet multiplied by 4x over 3, the perpendicular distance from the rotation axis. This must equal to the final angular momentum of the block after the bullet strikes it. We can use this equation to solve for omega. We know i, the moment of inertia of our block. We can square both sides of the equation, and we know omega squared from the previous slide. This allows us to solve for v, the initial velocity of the bullet. AcePhysics.org math and physics tutoring with Dr. Hudis.